going to read a passage from Acts chapter 17. It's a, it's a sermon that was preached uh, in early in church history, uh, preached by Paul uh, in a city called Athens. And we're just going to read it together, because um, I think it will lead on to, to what we're going to explore today. It says in, in Acts chapter 17... Paul, while he's in Athens, he's walking around and he sees these these carvings to different gods. And he says to them, verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. As I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. And does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. As I said earlier, the last few weeks we've been looking at these things that are at the heart of our faith. There's so much that we can discuss, so many things we can explore, questions we can ask, avenues we can go down, dead ends we can find ourselves in. Uh, but we've been exploring what's, what's at the heart, what's the stuff that, that really is the foundation, where we stand our feet, where we can discuss these things, but these are anchor points that keep us grounded, that essentially keep us Christian, that distinctive from, from other beliefs and practices. And in that sermon, you'll see some of them um, coming out, some of the things that we've explored. Jesus is the Christ uh, we looked at, the one who is the God's appointed Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, God the Father is the creator of heaven and earth, and he is our Father. Uh, Jesus is God in the flesh, that when we see him, we see the clearest picture of who God is. Uh, This sin, this thing that's destroyed the world, is anything that harms God, harms ourselves, or harms others. And last week, we looked at Jesus who died for our sin and was buried, was raised on the third day and was seen, that being the gospel, the most important thing. And then there's something else at the end of that passage, a bit that that makes preachers nervous when they preach this and makes churches nervous when preachers preach it, Uh, this idea that Jesus is a judge, that God is a judge. This whole idea, as I mentioned it, you think, oh man, not one of them. Bad week to invite the friend to come along. Um, bad week to turn up. He's going on the judgment of God. Here we go. We're going to explore this together, uh, what it means, why it's good news, uh, and hopefully see what, what is essential about this and also all the other stuff uh, that we do it. At the heart of this is this question that perhaps you've asked this week, perhaps you've asked today, as you look around and you see something that isn't right. And in you, this question comes up that says, why doesn't God do something about this? Or if it's particularly pertinent, you might say, why God doesn't, doesn't God do something about this now? It's a, it's a question that, that either you have at the forefront of your mind or you've learned to push to the back of your mind, but it's still there. This question, is God going to do something about the mess, the sin, the suffering, the pain, the darkness, the bleakness, the emptiness, everything that we don't want to focus on, but is there somewhere? Is God going to do something about it? Now, interestingly, this isn't a question that, that other species tend to ask. Pandas, they're cute and fluffy, aren't they? Pandas, if they have two cubs, often they'll reject one and keep one and keep that alive. They don't seem to have an issue with that. Humans, on the other hand, I know this because I have two children, if I was to choose one and select one to raise up, then we would have an issue with that. There is a question, is that right or wrong? Pandas don't seem to ask that question, but humans do. <coughs> Bears, I saw it on a national um, pro, uh, a creation, or creation, a David Attenborough program uh, this week. Bears will stand at the side of a river and catch salmon as they try desperately to deliver their babies upstream to their homeland. And they'll eat them on the spot. And they don't seem to have an issue with that. 
And yet in the human world, if someone was to stand outside a hospital and prevent mothers getting in, there'd be the question, this is awful, this is wrong, this question of right and wrong is in us. And I know that's uncomfortable to think about, but we all recognise it. And in asking the question, there is a clue to who we are. We are made with the ability to see evil and see good. And we recognise that, and we question that. And eventually we say, God, why don't you do something about this? We judge. Judging means, means to separate. We, we separate things. This is good. This is bad. This is right. This is wrong. And we do it all the time. Life's not fair. And the fact that we recognize it's not fair means we're making a judgment. This should be and this shouldn't be. But what about making it right? How do we get there? We, we, we often judge when we get it wrong sometimes, and sometimes we might get it closer to what is right. But either way, we're still trying to work out how do we make it right. There's a verse in, in, in Psalms that talks about God, and it says this. So, sorry, we need someone who can tell us what's right. That's what I'm saying. Someone who can tell us what's right, and someone who can make it right. And the Psalms talk about this person. They say, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Talking about God, when we think of God, righteousness and justice, God is right. Okay, God, God, God knows what is right, and he's also just, that he wants to make things right. And that's, that's where we, we come in with, with our Christian faith, and we say, well, okay, we have a God who is right and true and holy, and he's also just, he's going to make things right. And that's fine so far, we're, we're okay with that, we want a God who makes things right. And then we get to this question of how is he going to do it? And Christianity, for a probably the last hundred years in particular, but perhaps a bit longer than that, has got great, huge excitement, huge interest, uh, huge sales of books and preaching of sermons around trying to work out how is God going to make the world right? How is, how is it all going to end up at the end time? You, we talk about the end times, don't we? And if you want to excite people, you talk about the end times because people are like interested. What's going to happen? How is it going to work? What's God going to do at the end when he makes everything right? Uh, what's, what's the eternal life that God brings going to be like? What will it be like? Will we be married or, or how does that work? It says we're not married. Uh, will, will there, well, what will heaven be like when everything is made right? What's that going to look like? Will dogs be there? I hope so. Will cats be there? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> What, what, what is heaven going to be? What, what is this eternal life? What's, when God makes everything right, we get great interest and excitement and we try and grab it and try and wrestle with it. What's it going to be like? We get excited by it. We get confused by it. We, we hope for this. We wish for that. And there's all these wonderful things that will finally be undone. How is God going to do it? We don't really know. But we know it will be good and it will be right and just. But there's a flip side. What about the other thing? What about the second death? What's that like? Is it torment? Or are people tormented? Or are they in torment? How does how scripture seems to talk like that? It is, is, is it the wages of sin being paid out? Is it them being handed over? Or is it an active thing that's being done to them? Is it a metaphor? Is it the fire and the worms and those sort of things? Or is this the language of destruction? What's its length? Is it eternal in its experience? Or is it eternal in its consequences? Is it, is it God... Turn changing? Does God change from love to wrath? Is, is it something different? Or is it like some people say, the love of God being experienced, just like the sun can harden wax, it can melt clay, it does a different thing depending on who you are. What's it going to be like? We have all these questions. How's it going to work? What's the schedule? Is it, Hebrew says, do you die once and then there's a judgment? Is that it? You die, you go straight to judgment? Or elsewhere it seems to hint that you die and then there's a resurrection. There's a sleep and then there's a resurrection. Is that the schedule? What what are these passages trying to say? What's going to happen in between? Is it a thousand years? Is it is it premillennial, postmillennial? All these things that people debate. When's it going to come back? When's he going to do this? I understand in the last hundred years there have been sixty public predictions of Jesus Christ's return. Just so you know, all of them were wrong. How do I know that? Because he's not here. <laughs> 
Right, there's been this ramping up, this excitement. Interesting, it's been the last 100 years where we've got particularly excited. Before that, there's probably only 20 or 30 real um, wide, widely known predictions. But more and more, in, in Herbert Armstrong, he made four predictions. I don't know how he got away with that. <laughs> you get one wrong, you made you, you discredited, but he made four. In the year 2000, there are about 20 predictions. Obviously, God loves round numbers, so he's going to do it in the year 2000. And that came and went. And, and is this the end times? So is it the end times? Is that what we're in? Um, is that what, how we're meant to think about now? The New Testament seems to say that everything from Jesus ascending is the end times. Um, but the question then is, are we at the end of the end times? <laughs> and then, then how does that work? I mean, have all these, what's the sequence? All these, questions, all these things, and, and there are questions about these and differences about these, and people will say one thing and then say another, and people talk about it. Some people seem to talk very confidently about it, like they know um, and others don't, and some um, claim they know one thing. It, it's all very confusing. So that's what this point of this series is. What is the thing? With all this stuff we can discuss and debate and sit down with our Bibles and wrestle over and, and think about what is at the heart? For some of us, the questions are a bit more personal. Mm-hmm. What happens to those that we love? What happens to those who never heard about him? What about happens to those who misheard? What happens to those who are mistaught, those who are harmed by a representative of Jesus? Does their rejection, where does their rejection and the sin done to them, where do they cross over? What is the thing that we hold on to? While we can question so much and we're really uncertain about an awful lot, what is the thing that keeps us? I would suggest throughout Acts and throughout the New Testament, the one thing that they come back to The one thing Paul preached in that passage and that comes up time and time again is this. Jesus is the righteous judge who promises justice and invites us to trust him in the meantime. Of all the things that could be said and there's much that can be said, the thing that's at the heart, the thing that we cling to, that that is our foundation, is Jesus is God's appointed, his righteous judge, the one who will judge rightly And he promises justice. Another way to say that is he promises to make everything right. To restore everything. And in the meantime, he invites us to trust him. Just in case that seems not enough, I went back again to the early creeds. These statements of the early church when they tried to summarize all of their beliefs. And here's what they said about this. Jesus ascended into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. That's all they said about it. That was enough for them. Jesus is the one ascended and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Nicene Creed a bit later. He ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And everything else we can absolutely discuss and there is truth in it and there is caution in it and there is, there is things that we need to take on board. But the foundation, the heart of it is the idea that Jesus is a righteous judge and he will come to make everything right. And that, that's, that's one hand, it's, it's, it's a challenge to us. But what I also want to try and present today is that that is good news for us. The reason it's good news is because we don't know very much, I'm sorry to say. We judge an awful lot, but the reality is we don't know very much. The reason we don't know how Jesus will judge and what it will look like and why there are questions about it. The reason we don't know any of these things is because we are not the judge. And we can discuss and debate what the sentence might be, but we're not the judge. And we come up with these images and possibilities because deep down we want to be the judge. It's our culture, so just in case you aren't aware, our culture does not like the idea of being judged. <laughs> if you, like I say, if you mention it, it's a scary thing, it's an uncomfortable thing, but we do love to judge. <laughs> don't, like the, don't like the idea of being judged, but I do love to judge. Of course we don't call it that, we call it people watching. <laughs> just love people watching. I just, just love getting prayer requests. It's lovely when you share the, the things with me. It, it's lovely to see school friends, isn't it, on Facebook from years ago. Not, not commenting, of course, that they've gained so much weight and, and they look a bit greyer than you do, of course, but it's just nice to catch up. We, we, don't, we don't like to be judged, but we love to judge others. And it's our culture, more than any other, that rejects the idea of God as a judge because we want to be the judge. We want to be the ones who make it right. We want to be the ones who get back. We want to, to, to measure others and make sure we're living up to a higher standard. But the scripture again and again tells us 
you and I are unqualified for this role. We don't see it all. I look at you, I only see a certain amount. I don't see your story, I don't see your history, I don't see your genes and and the things that make you you. I don't see what you've been through and what you've suffered. We judge because we can't see it all. We, We can't judge because we have the wrong motives. I judge because I want to feel better about myself. I judge because I want to be in the right and and that requires you to be in the wrong. I judge, I can't judge because I simply lack the ability. I don't know, I can't measure things. I'm so messed up in what's right and what's wrong and how things work. And so Jesus gives this instruction to his disciples, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. The measure you use will come back on you. And so often what we do is we judge others and then fall short of our own judgment. Let, never mind God's measure or, or whatever other measure or heaven's measure. We mess up. I mess up on my own measure. I judge others and then I fall short of the very thing I condemn in others. What's interesting and what I found is those who are most vocal about God as a judge can often be the most judgmental. And if anything, that should not be the case. If you understand Jesus as our judge, it should make us less judgmental, not more. He's the one who is able to judge because he's righteous. He can judge rightly. And that for me is a comfort. There is one who sees everyone rightly, sees me rightly, sees you rightly, sees the world rightly, who sees it all and is able to say, this is what's going on. This is right and this is wrong. Who's able to separate out the different parts and all the elements that are at play. He sees it and he knows it. And he's able to judge rightly. All I know is his character. He's righteous. And that's a wonderful thing. Because he will get it right. He will make the right judgment. He will see things as they are. Not how I want them to be. How I hope they will be. But as they are. He sees it clearly. And he'll be right about it. What we also have is that it's not just righteousness that's the foundation. It's also justice. See, the other reason we as a culture don't like the idea of God as a judge is because by and large, we're on top. We're doing okay. We're successful. We're comfortable. We're all all right. There are other cultures in the world who celebrate God as judge because they are vulnerable. And they are weak and they are oppressed and they've been robbed and they have suffered. And they rejoice in Jesus as a judge because they're hoping for the day where God will make everything right. A reversal where those who are last will be first. And the reason we don't like Jesus as a judge is because by and large we're first in a lot of ways. And that's a challenge to us. But those who have suffered most rejoice in Jesus as a judge because they know a day is coming where everything they have endured, everything they have suffered, will one day be made right again. That's why the pattern you see in Scripture is Jesus goes to those who think they're first, the religious, and he uses his harshest language with them and his greatest threats are with those. And yet the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the women caught in adultery, when he judges them, when when he's acting in judge, he, he reverses the tables. He says to the, to, the, to the Pharisees, look, these guys are getting into the kingdom before you. They're first in line. This is the reversal that Jesus brings. Those who are poor become rich. Those who are oppressed become set free. And we often are either perpetrating it or we're, we're benefiting from it. But this injustice, Jesus is the judge who will make it right. And some people, and I hope we, can celebrate that because it tells us God takes our pain seriously. God hates what has happened to you. God hates what has happened to his children. God is opposed deeply to the ending of life. God is opposed deeply to the theft of land. God is opposed deeply to the oppression of people. God is opposed to the abuse of people. God is opposed to corruption and he's opposed to deceit and he's opposed to neglect and to rape and to racism and to lynching and to dehumanizing. He's opposed to these things and one day he will make them all right. Unless we have Jesus as a judge, we have no hope in these things. We simply have a shrug of the shoulders and that's the way it is. But Jesus as my judge says, one day these things will not be. One day I'm coming to divide what is right and wrong and then to take everything that is wrong 
and heal it and restore it and remake it and make it right again. That's why when we think of God's wrath, which gets wrapped up in this, we misunderstand it. It's not a vengeful, hateful thing. It's not a flying off the handle. It's God's decided opposition. It's his commitment. I am opposed to these things and I will never be for anything that will destroy or kill or rob or harm what I love most. God as my judge means he knows and he hears and he's taken account of it. And no matter who has ignored you and no matter what justice system may have failed you because our justice systems fail us, no matter who has turned a blind eye to your suffering, the judge of the world has known you, has known your pain, and will do something about it. Indeed, he became one of you, a victim in order to do just that. As one person put it, God is in solidarity with the victims. It's part of the message of the cross. God stands side by side with you. And the fact he's my judge is good news. He's the the one who will make it right. Not only that, but he's the one who will bring healing into it. See, when we tell people God is the judge, it's normally to scare them. It's normally to motivate them, get them to do something like we do with children. Maybe if you're a good parent, you you don't do this, but if you're like me, you do. You walk along and you go, oh, better behave yourself. There's a police car up there. (laughs) Oh, best behavior. There's a police person walking past. God is the judge. That's not what we're doing. We're not, oh, church, better behave yourself. God's the judge. He's coming. Oh, better put a bit more money in the offering because God's watching. Better look out. Yet so often, this is how it's you. We, we motivate people with this fear of God as a judge. But what if saying Jesus is my judge is the best news you could hear? What if it's a comfort? What if it's a strength? What if it's what gets me through each day and helps me to endure? Because I ask so often, why don't you do something about it? And when I see him as judge, I'm reminded I am and I will. I am and I will. I am the judge of all the earth. I will make everything right. A day is coming where everything will be dealt with. One verse says it like this, that he will bring to light what is hidden and darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. All those things that people have been able to bury and hide, they will not hide forever. Heaven must receive Jesus until the time comes for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets, a day is coming, he will restore everything. And and that's my hope. The Father, so these, these ideas that, that we, we give an account to God. And then I know most of us would say, well, if I have to give an account to God, that's not going to go very well. Which brings us to our next part. It's not just that there is a judge who, who is right and will make everything right. It's that Jesus is the judge who will judge right and make everything right. It says in John 5, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. We read it in the passage, he said a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. A time's coming where God will judge rightly and restore all things. But the one who's going to do that is the Jesus that we've spent the last five weeks talking about in different ways. He is the one who's going to judge. The one who, who, when the woman was dragged before him and thrown at his feet, caught in the midst of adultery, and he says the words, do none of these people condemn you? Then neither do I... Behave yourself, please come in. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But the one who says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. He's the judge. The one who, in his band of disciples, has these freedom fighters, these guys who use violence to try and overthrow the Roman authorities, and yet calls them to follow him and to have a changed heart towards them. He's the judge. The one who invites himself into the home of a corrupt tax collector, who's been lining his pockets with the money of his fellow citizens, and steps into his home and changes his heart so that he gives back four times what he took. He's the judge. The one who allows a prostitute to wander into a home and kneel at his feet and wash them with her tears and wipe them, allows another to pour expensive perfume all over him and doesn't condemn or chase them out or withdraw. He's the judge. The one that when the disciples choose violence in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
He goes to the Roman soldier who's tasked with arresting him and heals his ear. He's the judge. The one who as he hangs on the cross and they insult and they abuse and they mock and they spit and they jeer, chooses to pray, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. He's the judge. I think what we often do is we start with a judge and we work backwards. And what scripture is inviting us to do is start with Jesus and realize this is the one who will judge. See that verse in Psalm 89 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. But there's a second part. Love and faithfulness go before you. It's all these things. There is justice and there is righteousness. But there's also love and their faithfulness. And I think in our heads, what we do is we separate God into parts. You've got happy God, you've got angry God. You've got good cop, you've got bad cop. You've got Jesus, he's kind of nice and he'll let you off, but then the Father, you better watch out for him. But this idea is Jesus is all of this in their fullness. And he's the one who's earned the right. He's the one who has the ability. He's the one who has the power and the authority to judge. And he will do it rightly he will do it fairly. He will do it in justice and in righteousness. And he'll also do it in love and he'll do it in faithfulness. It's not saying he's a soft touch, but as much as I can trust Jesus to save me and sustain me and comfort me and protect me and guide me and teach me, I can also trust him to be the judge. And at the end, there's never going to be a situation where, where we have any questions, where we're saying, well, it didn't seem to right line up. It will be right. Yesterday I went to, to the Priory with Henry. James was at a party, so I just took him for a walk. And Henry saw the Priory and he said, that's a big building. I said, yeah, it is. He said, I think inside's a bit scary. I thought, oh no, I don't want him to think it's scary. So I said, well, let's go have a look. So he went inside and we walked in. And, and I've been there before with James. And James in the Priory, this was his response. This is a big room. I better make a load of noise. See how much echo I can get. Let's shout, let's praise, let's, 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 do some, let's make some noise. Because look, look how big and grand this is. And interestingly, Henry did the exact opposite. Without me saying anything, we walked in and he began to whisper. He began to talk really quietly. And I said, what are you doing? I said, I think we, we just need to be quiet in here. And I thought, at the end, these two boys, that <laughs> kids get it better than us. They, they, this is what will be the result at the end. When Jesus has judged and, and made everything right... There'll be two responses. There'll either be loud praise and adoration that the judge of all the earth is righteous and fair and has made it right and we praise him. Or there'll be humble silence, a quietness that just goes, yes, he's done it. And it's good. And I have no questions about it. And I have no objections. And I have no murmurs or complaints. It was fair and it's just and it's good. And it was full of love and faithfulness. Because this is who he is. This is how he, he treats us. And so I take all my questions. And that's why the last part of that fundamental bit is important. I take all my questions. Jesus is the righteous judge who promises justice. He will judge rightly and he'll make it right. It's Jesus who's going to do this. And he invites us to trust him in the meantime. Because we all have questions about how this is going to work out. We, who's going to get in and who's not going to get in and, and, and is there a second chance and, and what about loved ones and what about this and, and all these things and Jesus says you can trust me you can trust me there's a verse isn't there with Abraham where he's, he's discussing with God about saving certain people and he says this line he says will not the judge of the earth do what is right and when I have an abstract judge that I don't really know, when I talk about God as a judge somewhere up there, I go, I don't want that guy judging me. No, I don't trust him. But when I realize it's Jesus who's the judge, I find in me the ability to say, I can just trust him to do what's right. I can trust him to do what is fair because he is greater in righteousness than me. He's greater in justice than me. He's also greater in mercy than I am. He's also greater in kindness than I am. He's greater in patience than I am. He's greater in love than I am. He's greater in truth than I am. And so I'm willing to trust him with that. Now, I know some of these, that means that you might end up with answers to questions that don't fit into to neat boxes. 
doesn't solve every question we might have or, or, or give every answer, but again and again you'll find Jesus doesn't give us nice neat boxes to our questions. He gives us himself and says, you can trust me with this. You are unable to judge rightly. Even with all your Bible knowledge and all your verses, you are unable to judge rightly. So trust me to do it. And when I do it at the end, you'll say that was true, that was right, that was fair. But you'll also say that was kind, and that was good, and that was merciful, and that was loving. And I can trust him to do that. He promises justice and invites us to trust him in the meantime. Because he's the one who had injustice done to him. And he isn't coming here and he judges. He isn't seeking vengeance. He isn't seeking retribution. He isn't seeking to pay us back. He's seeking to make it all right, to restore all things. And he always does justice. And our God, Jesus, he loves mercy. And so we, when we judge, we do the same. When we can blame people, we're called to have mercy. When we can shame people, we're called to have mercy. When we can criticise people, we're called to have mercy. And when we condemn, we're called to have mercy. And when you have a political disagreement, you have mercy. And when you have a theological disagreement, you have mercy. And when you are certain you are completely right and they are completely wrong, you have mercy. And when you could get revenge and get even, you have mercy. Because our God, the one who judged us, is full of mercy. It's full of grace. And if any of that still makes you uncertain, the one who judges is the one who lays down his life for his sheep. The one who will expose and and show everything that's right is the one who says, come to me. Come to me, There there is mercy in abundance. There is forgiveness on offer. There is no need because the ideal calling to us is now we walk with him and there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ and for anyone who feels like there is there doesn't need to be for anyone who's been told that there is or convinced by the actions or the sermons or the studies that there is there is no condemnation that's why when we speak of a throne it's a throne of grace why we can sing, which we're going to do in a moment. Before the throne of God, I have a strong, a perfect plea. I come to him. And the fact that I come is a sign I realise this judge is not a scary thing. It's not an intimidating thing. It should be the most comforting, the most rewarding, the most hopeful thing that I have. Because he's right. One day he's going to make everything right. And I hold on to that. And all my other questions, and if you have questions, I'm happy to sit down and we'll discuss and we'll debate And all the how's it going to work out and where's it going to go and what's it going to look like. We can enjoy piecing it together. Trying to figure out what's being said, what isn't being said. But at the end of it, we get to trust him. That he will do what is right. That he is far, far more than I am. Far more merciful and kind and just and fair and loving and patient than you and I will ever be. So if that often means if my mercy seems to trump him, maybe I've misunderstood something. If my kindness seems to exceed his, then, then I'm willing to stand back and go, maybe I'm too harsh. Harsher even than God. But I don't know, because I'm not the judge. He is. And I get to trust him to do that right. Let me pray for us before we sing together. Father, I'm, I'm aware that there are times where, where these truths, these ideas have been wielded to, to motivate, perhaps in with good motives, but sometimes to harm. For some, this is the reason why they walked away from church. For some, this is the reason why they couldn't reconcile in their head who you are and, and who you've revealed yourself to be with how you've been portrayed. For others, it's just confusing. And we can't quite get our heads around it. I pray, Lord, that that the idea of you as a judge today wouldn't come across as a threat. It would come across as something that we put our hope in, something that we rejoice in, something that comforts. 
Because it means there is one who can decide once and for all what is right and what is not. What is good and what isn't. What belongs and what doesn't in this world of yours. And the comfort comes from knowing he's also the one who will make everything right. With every cry of our heart and every plea. With every longing that we have. And the aches and groans that we have. And the aches and groans of your creation. There is one who is coming who one day will restore all things. And that is our hope to persevere and to press on. At the end, while we're left with so many questions, Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that this is your role. We thank you because, Jesus, we love you. And we trust you to save us. We trust you to comfort us. We trust you to teach us. We trust you to lead us. And so we also get to trust you to judge us. That you are fair and right in that. That you are good and loving in that. Thank you because you're the one who suffered injustice. You're the one who cried out with questions. So you're the one who's qualified, who's earned our trust and is able to judge rightly. I just pray now, Lord, for any here who who feel in them that tinge of, of condemnation. Who the thought of giving an account to you fills them with dread or fear. I pray they would see the one who judges is the one who dies for them. The one who would divide right from wrong is the one who suffered for all the wrong that was in them. I pray they would walk from here free from any condemnation, free from any burden, free from the guilt, free from any shame. I also pray for those for whom this raises other questions, for loved ones and lost ones. I pray that they'll be able to trust you with those two, Lord. And so we come, Father, because the throne that we stand before, the judge we stand before, has made it possible for us to do it without any weight, without any barrier. We come to a throne of grace, grace upon grace. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that this should bring, for the comfort it should bring, and for those who are victims of the injustice in this world, draw near to them. We ask it in the name of our great judge, our great saviour, our great king, our Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.